Why do we really do what we do and where is it taking us? Like, what's the GPS that's on the end of our decisions and our choices every single day? Because I think we all know when the rubber meets the road, it's about two things. It isn't about anything superficial, materialistic, that's hollow. At the end of the day, it's about who we become and it's about what we give. And every single day, the process is happening constantly in life through opposition, through adversity, and through challenges. But I'm a firm believer, courage is the ability to start something without any guarantee of success. Go get it. You know, first and foremost, man, I want to let you all know it's an extreme, extreme honor and privilege to be here before you all uh, tonight. I'm grateful to be on this stage. But before I get started, man, can we give the coaches and the support staff that brought all the kids here tonight, can we give them a hand, please? It's awesome, man. May we also give... Um, pastor and his leadership here at this church a hand as well for opening up their doors. You know, it's awesome, man. You know, as I was standing backstage, I always think and reflect about situations, about life, and about my journey and how I got to this point. Like I was sharing with the guys earlier that I never planned to speak. I never wanted anything to do with it to be completely honest. I got placed in public speaking in college. I dropped the class on the second day. I hated it, I despised it, right? And when my career ended, I thought I would become a defensive backs coach. And I really wanted to coach football. And I got redirected again. And it brought me to a point in my life to where it was a heavy level of confusion because I grew up in the city of Atlanta in this environment that I scraped, I clawed, had a lot of great people help me get out of, make it to college, get to college, play football, start doing very well, things are looking up for me, my career ends, and I find myself back in the very community that I grew up in, two blocks away from where I grew up, with $250 in my pocket at my wife's grandmother's home. And my wife was pregnant about to have our first daughter. And it was in that moment that I realized I had no control over my life. Because I had been working from the time I was seven until the time I was 20, and every action, every decision, every choice was geared toward me trying to make it to this thing called the NFL, the National Football League, which I found out very soon and early that it didn't just stand for National Football League, it also stood for not for long. But every action was geared toward it, and as soon as I got close to it and thought it was about to happen, it was as if God said, not yet, I want to redirect you and take you this way. And I was like, God, but I'm right here. Like, let me get to the NFL so I can help my family and then redirect me. And God was saying, no, I got something even greater, even sweeter, and I know you can't see it right now, but I need you to trust me. And I'm like, God, I need you to trust me. Like, let me get it, God. I grew up two-bedroom home, 14 people, sleeping on the floor. The first time I uttered the words, I want to go to the NFL, the words that followed it up was, maybe I can get my own bed one day. Because me and my cousins were sleeping on pallets. I just wanted to get my own bed and pull my mother off the double shift at Wendy's. And so when I got to the moment that I thought it was about to manifest, I'm like, Lord, just give it to me. Let me get the contract. Go back, help my family, and then you can redirect me. And the Lord was like, no, I need you to trust me. Even though you can't trace me, Inky Johnson, I need you to trust me and just follow what I got. I need you to rejoice in the midst of opposition, in the midst of adversity, in the midst of trials. It's a big difference between quoting Scripture and having to live it. And I was finally at a point in my life to where I had to literally live the scripture. I had to live James chapter 1 when it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kind, because the testing of your faith goes on to produce perseverance, and perseverance must finish its race so that you may be complete and lacking nothing. I had to live it. 
I had to live the Romans 8.28 when it says, and we know that all things work to the good of those who love the Lord, who are called according to his will and his purpose. I had to live it. I had to live Jeremiah 29, 11, when it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Inky, I need you to trust me. I'm like, Lord, I need you to trust me. And then I, I started thinking about the day I got injured, and I went back, and I'm a detail guy, right? And so when I do something, I've never been the biggest, the fastest, the most strongest. Like, I've never been that guy. And so my advantage was always my work ethic, my attention to detail. And so when I showed up to play an opponent, I knew just about everything about him because that was my edge. And so I'm a routine guy. Like, I'll get up, eat oatmeal and banana, do it every single day, and my wife would be like, you need to eat an apple. I'm like, no, I need to stick to my routine. And when I went back and I analyzed the day, I'm looking at it from the time we left the hotel. And what I'm trying to see about the day that my career ended, I'm trying to see was it anything different that happened other than my injury. And so I'm like, man, I got up at the same time. I was like, I did my push-ups at the same time. I'm like, when we got out to the stadium, I did my same pregame drills. I did that W drill. I did a couple of DB drills. I did the same drills. I'm like, man, I even listened to the same pregame music. Phil Collins, I can feel it coming in. That was my jam, right? That's that Phil Collins, I get ready to go, right? I even listen to the same song. And I get in the fourth quarter of a game, a little bit under two minutes left, and I make a tackle that I can literally make with my eyes closed, and two hours later I'm in the emergency room and I'm fighting for my life. And I wake up the next day, my career's over, almost lost my life, got a paralyzed right arm and hand, and my life has completely changed. And somehow, when Coach Foreman walked into the room and said, Inky, how are you doing? I said, Coach, I'm blessed. I'm good. I'm still alive. My career's ended, but Coach, I'm blessed. And so when I went back to the moment that I fell in love with the game of football because I had to backtrack it to understand it, right? And when I went back to the moment that I fell in love with it, my situation and my circumstance made me fall in love with it, right? To the point to where I didn't start playing football on grass. I started playing football on concrete, right? I was playing in the street, per passion, not too much wisdom. Right? Scarred up, bloody, getting ass. I just loved it. Right? Like, I always ask people, what happened to the passion? Like, what happened to the love? What happened to the dedication and determination and level of commitment that when a person said, I want to do it, and they first start, right? It's not built upon politics. It's not built upon validation. It's built solely upon, I love this. I'm going to do it. I'm going to give everything I got to it. Right? And a guy said to me a few days ago, I was with the Chiefs, and a guy said to me, well, Inky, I don't like the way the coach is talking to me. I'm like, how old are you again? I'm like, you're like 25, right? He was like, yeah, but I can't take how the coach is talking to me, so I want to quit. I said, whatever you do, please don't quit. He was like, why? He's disrespecting me. I said, because if you quit, the danger of quitting is it has the possibility to become a habit, and then before long, you'll look up and you'll quit on your wife, you'll quit on your relationship with God, you'll quit on anything that brings a level of discomfort, and it doesn't give you the validation you want because you're not getting it and because you're not cut like that. I said, so whatever you do, don't quit. I said, but most importantly, when you first started doing it, what was it based upon? I said, or oh, was the passion counterfeit, or was it a real level of commitment? I'm talking about concrete commitment. I'm talking about the commitment that says, I am going to stay true to what I said I would do long after the mood that I've set it in has left. Because I think we all know in this room, character is not something that we inherit. Character is something we got to wake up every single day. We got to fight and we got to build it. In the midst of opposition, adversity, and challenges, like I told the guys I played with, I don't care how tall your daddy was, you got to do your own growing. In the midst of challenges, opposition, and pain. But when you think about what true courage is, true courage is the ability to accept pain and start things without any guarantee of success, but also understanding that the ability to learn is a gift even when pain is your teacher. 
And so for me, the game of football was pretty much like this stage. It was a platform that God had provided to cultivate a certain level of talent and excellence if I did it the right way. So one day when it stopped, it was certain things I could extract from it and apply and plug into other areas and aspects of my life. And so I could be successful no matter what I wanted to do. And so I never understood when somebody would quit on a wind sprint because I just looked at it as a wind sprint. And most importantly, it was something that somebody said, I wanted to play the game of football. And so if you wanted to play, why come out and complain about doing the work that it takes to be great? I said, but most importantly, a person should never complain about something that they're not willing to change. And if they're going to do it, why not try to be great at it? Why not try to see what we possess and put forth a level of excellence and greatness to see can we make our teammates and the people around us better? And so when I approached the game of football, the thing I loved about it was I got to inflict violence on another individual and not get in trouble for it. <laughs> I loved every bit of that. But something happened early in my life, and it shifted the trajectory of my life and still impacts the way that I live my life until this day. That's why when I first stepped on the stage, the first thing I did was I want to say thank you to the coaches, to the support staff, and everybody that brought the kids here tonight. Because I know what that means. It's that very act that changed my life. I probably wouldn't be on this stage before you tonight if that didn't happen in my life when I was around nine years old. And what happened was I was playing football in the street, blue pickup truck pulls up. And me and my cousins would play every single night like clockwork. The routine was simple. I just wanted to ignite the process of what we wanted, right? I didn't want to say we wanted something and not work for it. I wanted to ignite the process so we can engage in consistent action. And so that being in the street, light pole to light pole, that was the process for us. That being in the street every single night till the street lights pop on, that was process for us. Right? I didn't want to say I wanted it, and then we go in the house, we sit on the couch, and we start playing video games. No, if we really want it, we're going to get in the street and we're going to work for it. And so one night, a blue pickup truck pulled up, and I'll never forget it. Man, he changed my life. Out of the truck got the first white guy we'd ever saw in our neighborhood. Every drug dealer took off running. They thought he was the police. <laughs> God, nicest guy in the world, man. And he walks over between our game and he said, man, would y'all like to play football on grass? I said, man, I would love that, man. Where you been, brother? The street getting rough. <laughs> he said, go in the house, get your parents. Let me talk to them. I ran in the house. My uncle JJ was present. I said, hey, uncle, will you please come and speak to this gentleman? Uncle said, sure. Uncle walked outside. Guy extended his hand. He said, hey, man, my name is Trey Hurst. He said, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't even supposed to be over here. He said, I brought a kid home after practice a couple blocks up. He said, I see these little knuckleheads playing tackle football in the street. He said, I run a program across town. I think if you bring the boys out, it was me and my three younger cousins. He said, I think it would be a great opportunity for them to make an impact their life. He didn't say anything about football. He said, I think it can impact their life. I think it can help them. My uncle responded. He said, sir, we greatly appreciate it. He said, but I hate to inform you, we just don't have the money for anything like that. He pointed at me, he said, Inky's mother, she's a single mother, working a double shift at Wendy, she don't have it. He said, the other three, their fathers are in and out of the system. They don't have it. The coach, without any hesitation, says, I tell you what, you bring them to the park tomorrow, I'll sign them up, I'll pay for it with my own money. I tapped my cousin's leg. I said, man, he hasn't even seen my spin move yet, man. <laughs> I said, what type of guy is this? And he hadn't even seen us play. Right? He hadn't seen us do nothing. And so the next day when my uncle brought us to the park, I'm standing in line beside him because I wanted to understand his thought process. Not so much of the action. I was extremely grateful for the action. But I wanted to understand what made him stop and do this for me and my three younger cousins when he didn't have to. And when I got to the park, I soon understood it wasn't just something he did for me and my three younger cousins. He did it for kids all across Atlanta. He was already successful in construction. He had his own business. He didn't have to be a little league coach, let alone he didn't have to stop on the east side of Atlanta for Inky and his scrawny little two little, three little cousins. And so when I'm standing there, I'm watching him pay for us to play ball. And in my family, the only people that ended up going to college was me and my three younger cousins that he paid for in that street that day. I still remember he bought me my first steak. And I'm tripping. I'm like, man, coach bought me a steak. I 
I still remember I was in the backfield, and it was me and Thomas Brown, and we ran the wishbone offense, and Thomas Brown played tailback at Georgia. Now he's the running back coach at Miami. And we ran this split little wishbone offense, and coach had us running the play in practice, right? And he was standing on the sideline with a stopwatch. And he would always hold up the stopwatch when we hit it at the right time. And he would say to us, if you hit it at this time, Inc., if you hit it at this time, T-Bone, it'll be a touchdown. And we're sitting in the backfield one day, and he makes us run this particular play 20 times. And I'll never forget him running back to the huddle, and I say to T-Bone, I said, man, I don't think Coach know what he's doing. We done ran this play 20 times. He said, what'd you say, Inc.? I said, nothing. <laughs> he said, you don't think I know what I'm doing? I said, no, Coach. He said, run it 10 more times. <laughs> I did it 10 more times. We got to the game. Every time we ran that play and he held that stop, watch up. And we hit that time, six. And every time he told me something, anytime he said, Inky, you need to do this in school, you need to sit in the front of the class, Inky, you need to show respect, Inky, when you're in your neighborhood, you need to treat people like this. Through the vehicle of football, he taught me how to live life. But it wasn't until I understood it until one night when he had to take me home, when my mother couldn't make it off her shift, and when my mother would come to the park, I would be there late, 9 o'clock at night, right? Mother be in a car with a car lights on, I'm doing backpelling drills, right? Asking my mother, can she sit in a car so I can make it to the NFL? She's sitting there, and I know she's tired. And she called coach and said, I can't make it off of my shift. Can you take Inky home? He said, sure, no problem. We pull up to my house, 125 Warren. I get out of the truck, I said, uh, Coach, all right. He said, all right, Inc., I'll see you tomorrow at practice. I said, can I ask you one question? He said, sure, what you got, buddy? I said, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. He opened his door, got out of his truck, walked around, stood directly in front of me. He said, son, I love you. First man ever tell me love me. He said, Inc., you can't disrespect me, what you got? I said, why do you live life the way that you live it? He said, I'm going to share something with you, Inc., and I don't want you to ever forget it. And in his simplicity, it was yet profound. And all he said to me was, as long as you can live your life and make sure that somebody else's life is okay, he said, son, your life will always be okay. And he got in his truck and he left. And the way I processed it was, man, if I can annihilate my ego and my pride. But the formula of what he said, the formula of, Inky, as long as you can make sure that somebody else's life is okay, your life will always be okay. The formula of what he said, I took it and applied it to everything that I touched and everything that I did. Every sport that I played, I was a four-sport athlete coming up. I ran track, I played baseball, I played basketball, and I played football. If you can make sure that somebody else's life is okay, Inky, your life will always be okay. And so my level of what a teammate was, it had a totally different meaning to me. Like with my family, I always tell people, when I was on a team, I didn't play with my teammates, I played for my teammates. Like I don't live with my family, I live for my family. Like the meaning is different. Like the play that I got injured, people don't even notice. They just look at the play and they see it and they're like, oh man, Inky got hurt. They don't know, that wasn't even my guy. I had my guy. My teammate busted, two of them. That if they would have had their assignment, who knows what would have happened. But if that play unfolded today, I'll go at that play the exact same way because I looked at my teammates in the tunnel and I told them I got your back. I didn't conditionalize it. I didn't say, oh, I got your back unless this happens. No, I got your back. Come hell or high water, I got your back. More than runs, I got your back. When we show up and you're not feeling it, I'm going to bring it. I got your back. When I'm not feeling it, I need you to bring it. I got your back. As long as you can make sure that somebody else's life is okay, son, your life will always be okay. I locked into that principle and everything that I did. And so I took a pride in everything that I touched because I wasn't just doing it for me. I was doing it for the glory of the Lord. And so when you do things for the glory of the Lord, when guys stepped into the stadium, they would be like, man, you see that cheerleader on the third row? I would look at him and say, bro, I love the way the grass smells. Like, I love to see them lining out the field. I used to wash my own helmet. You know how equipment guys get the helmets, and they're washing them and cleaning them so they could be ready for the game? I used to sit there with them, and I would be washing my helmet so after the game I could see how many scars. I love the game. 
Like, I loved everything about it. And so when I got my scholarship to go to Tennessee, I'm like, man, it's Mayberry. I'm like, y'all get five meals a day? You either got a smoothie machine. You got a, you got a barber chair. Like, you got, you got training table. You get gear. Like, you get all this stuff. Most importantly, you get a process that if you follow the process, you get a shot. Not a shot at the NFL. You get a shot at the great equalizer in life, your education. I said, all I got to do is have the character to do what I say I'm going to do and show up at the time I say I'm going to show up, and I get a shot to do what I always wanted to do. And when I got there, the thing that was the hardest for me was you saw people that took it for granted. The hardest thing after my injury, it wasn't that I would show up and I'm like, man, I can't play anymore. That wasn't the hardest thing for me. The hardest thing was when I would have to stand on the sideline and watch a game and watch a practice and you would see guys that took it for granted and treated it like it was nothing. You would see people show up and they just didn't appreciate what they had and you had guys that gave everything they had to it and for some strange reason something happened and they couldn't do it anymore. The saddest thing in the world when you see somebody with potential and a skill set out of this world and people are pouring into them and telling them how great they can become and they just don't appreciate it and they become a zombie and they end up being a person that show up and they count the hours and they don't make the hours count. And so they asked me one question, Ink, what's your plan? I said, my plan is simple. I want to graduate in three years and go to the NFL so I can help my family. They said, well, Inky, you didn't just knock it out in your test scores. I said, yeah, I'm not a good test taker, but I really need to help my family. And I end up starting my sophomore year. Junior year, I come out, I'm playing. I play as a freshman, special teams, got in a couple of games as a dime, nickel, come into my sophomore season, have a great sophomore season. Junior season, start starting, everything is going great. Come out strong against California Bears, nominated SEC Defensive Player of the Week, first week, second game plan against Air Force. And we're thinking, man, we're just going to come out, roll over Air Force, game will be over, get ready for Florida the next week. Air Force come out and they're running the triple option. And if you meet a team that runs the triple option very well, and you're in the SEC where you don't face the triple option every week, it can become a problem if you find somebody that run it right. And Air Force ran it right. And I knew it was a problem when me and the guys would get in the huddle on defense and we would look at each other and say, man, who had the ball? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're like, who had the ball, man? And guys like, oh no, line up, right? And we just line up, right? And we get to the fourth quarter of this game and at this point it's heavy frustration because we've got popped in the mouth by Air Force. And so we're in the huddle and we're breaking the huddle, and I tell the guys, I say, man, if it comes my way, let me get it. Let me get him. I'm going to end the game. Let me get him. And that, as the play is unfolding, I got quarters coverage. And so I'm backpedaling to my quarter, and I can see the play unfold. I can see it clear like it's an HD. And I see the quarterback rolling, and he's dropping back. And before I take off to go make the tackle, I say, thank you, God. I got exactly what I asked for. Before I go to make the play, Thank you, God, I got exactly what I asked for. And I take off running, full head of steam. I ran a 4.38 in the 40. I don't know what the guy ran, but he was coming too. And I'm trying to separate him from the ball. And as soon as I hit him, something happened that never happened to me before in my life. As soon as I hit him, it seemed as if every breath in my body left. My body went completely limp. I lost control. I fell to the ground. I blacked out. It had never happened to me before. When my eyes opened, my teammates ran over to me. They said, Ink, get up. Let's rock. Let's go. Let's close them out. I said, I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't? You always get up, man. You're our guy. I said, I know, but I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't? I said, I can't move. They said, there's a shock going from the crown of my head to the bottom of my feet. I can't feel anything. The shock eventually left, but it stayed in my right arm and hand. They brought the spine board out. They put me on the spine board. They wheeled me off the field. We get to the ambulance, and my father is standing there. And I say to my father, I said, Pops, I got him, right? I put it on him, right? He said, yep, Ink, but I think you got the worst part of this one. They rolled me up in the ambulance. They said, Ink, we'll take you over, run a couple tests. It's football. Things happen. You'll be fine, man. They take me over. They run their tests. They bring me back into a room. My mother comes in, kisses me, says a prayer, cracks a joke, says, Ink, you'll be fine. Football. Things happen. And she's going to walk out, and I'm watching my mother walk out 
But as she's exiting the room, I can hear footsteps from the opposite side. And when I turn to look, it's the head doctor, and he's running at this point, and he's screaming. And I'll never forget, he says, guys, guys, get in here. Got to rush this kid back to emergency surgery. He's about to die. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, man, you can't use another word? <laughs> I'm like, use a synonym, brother, like die? I'm thinking he's trying to shock me. I'm like, like, die, die. He's like, yeah, die. I'm like, what happened? He said, you ruptured your subclavian artery in your chest. You're bleeding internally. He said, we got to rush you back, take the main vein out of your left leg, plug it into your chest in order to save your life. He said, oh, I guarantee you, you won't be here in the morning. I said, let's go. The next morning I woke up, it's top three most embarrassing moments of my life. People were coming over to my bed saying, Ink, man, you deserve it, man. You're a good guy, man. You deserve the NFL. You work hard. You never cheated the game. You did things the right way. You deserve it, man. This shouldn't have happened to you. And I'm sitting there, and I don't know if you've ever been through something that the situation holds so much conviction that it makes you self-assess and question your principles and your values about life. I went into surgery for an artery. I came out of surgery, got cut six times down my left thigh, one time across the left side of my neck, one time across the right side of my neck, twice through my right ribs, cut out my right pec, bottom of my armpit to the bottom of my hand, 350 staples in my body, bandaged me from my neck to my knees. This ain't lip service. I'm like, what happened? They're like, yeah, when we went to do the artery, we noticed you had torn the nerves in your brachial plexus. I'm like, what's that? Nerve roots that go from your spine, they control your shoulder, your arm, and your hand. They go into your spine like a plug. You rip them out, they can't be replugged. They were telling me in that moment, pretty much, Inc., it's a soft landing, but your career is pretty much over. And I was so embarrassed because I felt like I had shortchanged God. I'm like, man, with all the gifts, talents, and abilities that God had blessed you with, the only thing you were focused on was the NFL? That's low-hanging fruit. I'm like, Ink, was that it? Like, and my father is sitting there, and everybody is analyzing the situation, trying to see how I'm going to respond, and my father's on fire. And the first thing my father says to me is, Ink, how does this God that you love so much let this happen to you? How does it God, Ink, you go to FCA for, let this happen to you? How does the God you go to church for let this happen to you? How does this God you pray to, son, let this happen to you? I see when you make a play and you say, glory to God. Well, if God is so good, Inc., how could this God let this happen to you? And I'm like, oh, man, God going to spank him. <laughs> I'm like, God going to spank him. But his frustration was real. Because through his lenses, all he can see is, my son is hurt. All he could see is the two people that I've loved the most my whole life was my mother and my son, and I lost my mother at 14 to cancer. And so when your mother had you, I was running because I was scared and I didn't have anybody. And now when I get back in my son's life and we got a decent relationship, now my son is crazy about God and his career ends and he almost loses his life. Man, what's up with this God? And I'm sitting there like, God, what's up? And God, like, no, I got you. And I'm like, man, you got a funny way of showing it. And they're like, Inky, you're going to be in the hospital the next 40 or 60 days. I'm like, can you order me a Dunjoy sling? They're like, why? I'm like, I need to go back to practice with my teammates. They're like, Inky, you need to take a break. Something traumatic has happened to you. I'm like, no, I made a vow to my teammates. I'm like, I got to go back to class. I got to graduate. They saved my life Saturday night. I was back in class Monday. You know the crazy thing about life? You got some cats, they get an ACL. They act like they can't go to nothing. <laughs> they can't come to school. They can't eat. It's crazy to me. Like Eric Berry wears number 29 in the NFL in honor of me. And he doesn't wear that because of what I did as a player. He wears that because when I got injured and I got back to practice that next Wednesday after they saved my life, and we were in the sand pit, and I looked at him in the sand pit, and I said, you better not let me beat you. 
and no drill. And I had a Dunjoy sling and I had a Velcro strap, two of them strapped to my body and they had my arm like this so I could run sprints and so I could be in the, in the sand pit with my teammate. Like team means something totally different to me. Like my teammates showed up at my house when I got injured and they were in my closet because I had to learn how to tie my shoe and they were in my closet before I learned and they were making sure all of my shoes were tied. It means something different to me. Like my teammates showed up at my house and they were like, Ink, you need us to take you to church? We got you, man, whatever you need. Like teammates mean something totally different to me. They showed up, Inky, you need to go to FCA. I know you bandaged up. We got you. What you need? It means something totally different to me. And I didn't tell my teammates when I signed on at Tennessee that, yeah, man, I'm going to be a great teammate unless I get injured. No, I'm going to be a great teammate. In spite of an injury, I'm going to still show up and I'm going to still go to meetings. In spite of, if I almost lose my life, the funny thing about it is, at the end of the day, you got to take my life before you take my drive. Because I'm not working for accolades. I'm not working for statistics. I wasn't playing for that. In Colossians 3.23, it says, do all things as if you're doing it for the glory of God. And if I'm doing something for the glory of God, at a certain point, when the opposition, the adversity, and the challenges hit, I rejoice because I know it's God trying to take me to the next level. And so the discomfort for me is great. Like, at a certain point, the comfort zone, young people have to understand, the comfort zone is a beautiful place, but nothing ever grows there. You can be comfortable all you want. But you can equate comfort to being stagnant. If a person never wants to grow, it's heavy sacrifice involved and it's heavy discomfort involved. And so as I'm sitting here and I'm going to practice, my father says something to me and it shook me to my core. My father came to me and said, Ink, you know what? I'm gonna come and stay with you for the next 30 days. I had never been on the same roof as my father. I'm talking about staying for consecutive days. That never happened. He said, I'm going to come, I'm going to take you to class, I'm going to take you to church, I'm going to take you to rehab for your arm, I'm going to do everything with you. I'm like, okay. And so my father would take me to FCA discipleship, and he would be there, and he would stand literally outside of the door, and he would hear me and the chaplain going back and forth, and he would just stand there. When the session would end, he would say, ain't you good? I would say, yes, sir. He would take me. He would show up in the training room. He would lay on the table. He would say, can I get a heat pack? They would put one heat pack on, and then he would say, can I get another one? They would say, you sure it's kind of hot? He would say, yeah, I need it. They would put another one on literally until one day they put so many heat packs on his back, they pulled them up, and his back was completely raw. He was carrying a burden that wasn't his to carry in the first place. He didn't know who to give it to. Right? Like, because it was like Wi-Fi. He had no connection. And so he's carrying burdens that wasn't meant for him to carry, and it's weighing him down. And every single day, I prayed at the same time. And my roommates at that time was Ramon Foster, who plays and starts at guard for the Pittsburgh Steelers right now, number 73. It was Gerard Mayo, went first round, 10 pick to the New England Patriots. It was Robert Ayers, went first round, 18 pick, to the Denver Broncos. And every single night, me and Ramon's room was beside each other. And so when I would get on my knees to pray, my father would always come by my room and he would say, Ink, you need anything? I would say, no, sir, I'm good. He would say, hey, big boy, to Ramon. Ramon, 6'7", 380 pounds. Say, big boy, Ramon, say, yes, sir. You say, you good? He said, yeah, pops, I'm good. And on the 29th day, I find it odd, my number's 29. My favorite Bible verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. On the 29th day, I'm on my knees to pray, and my father comes by my room. He says, hey, Ink, you need anything? I said, no, sir, I'm good. I see my father step off. He said, hey, big boy. Ramon said, I'm good, pops. He steps back into my room, and he says, Ink, man, I want to talk to you about something. I'm still on my knees. I said, yes, sir. He said, you know that God you pray to? I said, yes, sir. He said, you know that God I take you to discipleship about? I said, yes, sir. He said, you know that God I take you to FCA, church, all of that? I said, yes, sir. He said, if that God can help you handle this situation the way you're handling it, he said, son, I want to give my life to Christ. I said, praise God. Let's do it. <laughs> my father went and gave his life to Christ. 
My father is headed down a path of destruction. And so young people, I'm gonna tell you something. Whenever you look at a situation, don't just look at the situation for what it is. Look at the collateral damage that's attached to it. My father was headed down a path of destruction. He had three daughters. When my father got saved and got his salvation, my father's household was corrected. My three teammates and roommates and best friends that were in my household, all of them gave their life to Christ. And so when I look at this situation and people call the million dollar question, Inky, why wouldn't you change what happened to you? I'm like, you serious? I'm like, let me tell you why I wouldn't change it. If I had to put on a scale the NFL, my father's salvation, my three best friends' salvation, if I had to weigh it on a scale and, and they said, Inky, pick, what would you choose? 10 out of 10 times, I'm going to pick my friend's salvation and my father's salvation. Because I know, I'm, I'm wise enough to understand, this is the real contract. And it's long and it's rich. It's more fulfilling. It's sweeter. It might involve a little pain and a little pruning that you don't understand. But when you come through it, you'll be a better person because of it. I just want one thing from you. Like through the game of football, be a vessel. Like, pick up your cross every day, like, through the game of football, let your light shine through the game of football. Like, reflect more than just an athlete and remember who you are as a person is far more important than who you are as a football player. Because we all going to hit that wall. We're all going to hit opposition. We're all going to hit adversity. But I think we all know at the core, it's never about what happens to you. It's about how you respond to it. You can control that. Like, people are resilient. Like everybody in this room, I'm sure it's a lot of ballers in here. Like resilient, got the fortitude. Like you put a goal in front of them, they'll smash it, they'll chase it down. People are resilient. Like when you put goals in front of them, they chase it, resilient, right? And if you're resilient, you'll get whatever you're looking for if you're resilient. If you're consistent, you'll keep it. But if you're grateful, whatever you want will increase. In life, people don't burn out because of what they do. People burn out because life makes them forget why they do it. And so every single day, with whatever you do, if it's football, if it's basketball, whatever the case may be, every single day when you do it, before you approach it, ask yourself a question. Like at the core, I'm talking about with conviction. Say, why do I really do it? But most importantly, who am I really doing it for? Am I doing it for my ego? Am I doing it for my pride? Am I doing it for superficial or materialistic? Or am I doing it to bring glory to the Lord? And I guarantee you, for I've lived it. Like, I've lived both ends of it. I work with NFL teams every day of the week, and I walked out of a session last week, and I was like, man, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't believe how close the gap is from NFL players to high schoolers in the mindset. Like, I see it. And guys come out and they got an identity crisis. They don't know who to put their, their identity, their character, and they got an identity crisis. Because the moment the jersey is snatched off of them, the moment they say, cut, you're free to go, go live. The moment they say, you're no longer a football player, they don't know what to do. They start blaming. Now it's everybody else's fault. They get mad, they get enraged. They get mad at life. They don't remember, okay, I played this game. I did it well. I was blessed to be able to do it. Thank you, Lord. When my injury happened, I asked the Lord on that play. I said, thank you, Lord. I got exactly what I asked for. And I can hear the Lord as I was going through rehab at the Mayo Clinic with the best doctors in the world. And the only thing they could tell me was, Inky, we can't guarantee you anything. I can hear the Lord saying, are you still thankful for it? And every single day I get up and everything that comes my way, I say, thank you, Lord. I appreciate it. Thank you, Lord, because I stand on the truth of consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kind. Thank you, Lord. And so when my career ended, I said, okay, cool. My career ended. My arm and my hand is paralyzed. My heart isn't. My arm and my hand is paralyzed. My mindset isn't. My arm and my hand is paralyzed. My drive isn't. My arm and my hand is paralyzed. My commitment level isn't. My arm and my hand is paralyzed. My passion isn't. My arm and my hand is paralyzed. My relationship with Christ isn't. 
And so every single day of my natural born life, I'm going to get up and I'm going to use this arm, not just with like how I live my life, I'm going to use this arm every single day of my life to impact another life. I owe people one thing every single day. And the one thing I owe everybody I come in contact with, I owe you to give you excellence when I'm in your presence. The least we can do, if God blesses us to be able to do something, the least we could do is give him everything we got that we're blessed to be able to do it. Bow your heads, fellas. I'm going to close us out with a prayer. Most incredible, most gracious God, we come to you humbling ourselves in your presence. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your power. We ask for your forgiveness. Father God, we've all fallen short. Father God, we've all sinned, Father God. We've all gotten off the tracks here, there. We've all lost our identity. We've all done things to where we shifted our focus and we weren't as focused on you as we should have been. Father God, I ask, could you bless them in everything they do? Could you bless everything they touch? Father God, may you bless them to understand that you bring real peace. I'm talking about the peace that surpasses understanding. Father God, can you bless them with the level of drive, the level of dedication, the level of commitment that comes as a result of a relationship with you? Father God, may you help them to understand that you are the only one that could take a test and turn it into a testimony. Father God, may you help them to understand that you are the only one that can take a mess and turn it into a message. Father God, may you help them to understand that you are the only one that can take a victim and turn them into victory. Father God, we ask all these blessings in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you guys, man. Thank you so much. Thank you.